that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? We're going through excuses that Christians, Christians can use uh, not to keep the Ten Commandments. Or maybe I should say scriptures that Christians use to try to disprove that, okay, we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments or the Ten Commandments have been abolished or, or done away with or nailed to the cross and it's all been fulfilled and so we don't have to keep those. Okay, excuses that Christians use for not keeping the Ten Commandments, the law of God. All right, recently someone asked me a question, thought it was a good question. It says, what do you do when your church is teaching that the law has been abolished and nailed to the cross? Now, first of all, if you're in a church where you're hearing this, and if you are a rational thinking person, now, that may be a big if, if you think in church, but you really should consider a, a red light should go off when you hear those statements coming from pulpits, coming from preachers, that the law has been abolished, it's been nailed to the cross, it's been done away with. There's a red flag should go up immediately, and you should question that. So what do you do when your church is teaching that the law is abolished and been nailed to the cross? Well, the first thing you do is find another church. Now, I say that, but I also realize that that's difficult to do because in church, church is not just about, you know, we think it's, a, it's about truth and we're standing on the word of God and all this stuff, but it's, it's more about relationships, friendships, and often those relationships and friendships is what keeps us from leaving or moving away or finding another church. We're, it, you know, it's more about, instead of truth, it's more about those relationships that you can have with, with good people, good friends, family members. And it's difficult to leave a church. I understand that. Now, you could try, if you're in a church where they're teaching the law has been abolished, been nailed to the cross, you could try to convince the preacher that he's wrong you know, but it, that's going to be nearly impossible. I mean, absolutely nearly impossible. Because you see, he's been to cemetery school. Did I say cemetery school? Oh, seminary school. All right. Uh, that's where he's been. And he is taught a way to think about how to look at scriptures. And he's taught a lot of these scriptures that I'm going through today and have been going through for the past month. Uh, about excuses Christians use for not keeping, keeping the law of God. So, and, and what he's taught is, you know, he's taught, well, this is proof. We don't have to do this. This is proof it's been done away with. This is proof it's been nailed to the cross, you know. And they pick all of their scriptures. Now, again, this is a whole series, I'm, a series I've been going through. And if you would like to get the whole package, just write me and let me know. Because this is, this is critical information for you to have. If you are ever to combat and fight against a, actually a spiritual battle that is going on for the thoughts and the control of religious people's minds, it, it's a, a valuable piece of information that I have here with all of these excuses I've been going through. All right, this one is what we're looking at today is two scriptures, Romans 3 and verse 20 and Romans 2 and verse 13. Let's read this. Romans 3 and verse 20, first one. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. All right, then we're going to drop back to Romans 2 and verse 13, which seems to say the exact opposite. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, <laughs> this seems like an absolute contradiction. This seems like Paul is talking out of both sides of his mouth. Now, in an earlier program, what we've gone through is that the Bible never contradicts itself. One of the first things you want to do when you study the Bible is just to realize, okay, as I pick this book up, 
I got to understand that the Bible does not contradict itself. And if you run into a contradiction like this that we just read, the problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with our understanding of the Bible. All right. And so what this seems to be saying here, it looks like on the surface, it looks like these two scriptures are saying, you know, first of all, it says no one is going to be justified by keeping the law. And then it turns around and almost seems to say only those who are keeping the law are going to be justified. Let's read it again. Romans 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then Romans 2 and verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Okay, so let's go into this and try to explain it here. First of all, first thing you need to understand about these two verses that seem to contradict one another, the first and critical important thing to understand is the role of the law. You will never understand these two verses unless you understand the role of the law. In other words, why God gave the law in the first place. Unless you understand this, you will never understand these two verses. All right, let's look at it. Romans 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, Paul answers the question in this verse. What question? Well, the question of why can't we be justified, made right before God by keeping the law? The, the answer is because by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, the law is revelatory. It tells us what sin is. That's the role of the law, to educate and reveal. 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the breaking of God's law. That's the purpose of the law, to tell us what sin is. Now, let me give you an, an analogy here. Let's say a speed limit sign. It says drive 55. The purpose of that speed limit sign is to give you the knowledge of how fast you should drive. Now, question, can it make you drive 55? Not really. That's not the role of the law. The role of that speed limit sign is just to tell you what the speed limit is, 55, what you should be driving. That's the role. The law is revelatory. That's the, it reveals what sin is. You see, doing the right thing has to do with relationship. Now, I'm sort of switching gears here because now I'm, I'm going over into a relationship with God, but doing the right thing as far as God is concerned, it has to do with respect. It has to do with respect for the lawgiver. Okay? It has to do with the knowledge that this law is really for my own good, my own well-being. It's sort of like that speed limit sign, drive 55. Now, if you drive 110, you know, I mean, there's a big difference between hitting a tree at 110 and hitting a tree at 55, you know. Well, both are bad, but at least, you know, the airbags may save you. But, but I'm just saying that, okay, the knowledge that the state has put up for me speed limit signs for my own good, the respect, appreciation for the lawgiver, you see. Now, again, I'm switching gears, you know, using the state and then switching over to a relationship with God. All right. The knowledge that this law is really for my own good and respect for the lawgiver. And then, of course, you have grace. And grace is I have broken these laws and the lawgiver has freely forgiven me. All right. Romans 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So why can't we be made right by the law? Justified, made right by keeping the law. Well, let's say, okay, let me give you another little story here. Let's say we get really serious about keeping God's law. Let's say I finally figure out that the law is for my own good, that the law that says don't commit adultery is really for my own good, okay? You know, a lot of people think, well, why didn't God just say commit adultery? No, he said don't commit adultery. Okay, now, you know, there are for a better term, bugs that can be transmitted back and forth between husband and wife when they have sexual relationship, and, and nothing happens. You know, it's just, you know, passing back and forth from each other, from one another. But when you introduce multiple partners, and this person, this strange flesh, and that strange flesh, these bugs 
mutate, divide and conquer, and that's where STDs come from. Okay, so did God know what he was talking about when he said, hey, uh, people, uh, don't commit adultery. Stay faithful to your wife. Stay faithful to your husband. Did he know what he was talking about? Did he put, he gave us that for our own good, you see. And this is where, you know, appreciation for the lawgiver, respect for the lawgiver, because God has given me this law. He's given me this law that is really for my own good and my own well-being, you see. Now, let's say I say, okay, God, I'm keeping your law. I'm saying this to God, and I am right in your eyes. I should be justified in your eyes, made right. Okay. And God comes along and says, no, wait a minute. Okay, you're, you're doing a pretty good job at keeping my law. But what about all those commandments before? What about all those sins you committed before? What about all those commandments you broke before? What about all those sins before you got serious about really keeping my law? What about all those? You see, this is why the law can't make you right. Because your past has to be forgiven. In fact, the Bible says this in Romans 3 and verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Did you know that? Okay, Remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. In other words, just because I start keeping the law today does nothing about my law breaking in the past, you see. And this is where grace comes in. And you know, grace, even after we get serious about keeping God's law, we still fall flat on our face from time to time. And this is where grace comes in undeserved pardon. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. Roma, okay, let's take a look at Romans 2 and verse 13. Uh, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Only the doers of the law come into a position to be justified or made right by God's grace. Why? Question. Why? Why is that? Why is only the doers of the law, why do they only come into a position to be forgiven by God's grace? Because they have repented of breaking the law. It's just that simple. They have repented of breaking the law. So only the doers, they have, they're sorry for breaking it, and now they're making an effort to keep the law. Only the doers come into a position to be justified by God's grace. Now, the hearers. Let's talk about, we've got doers and we've got hearers of the law. Now, who are the hearers of the law? Well, they're, they're the ones that are teaching you the law has been abolished, been nailed to the cross, has been done away with. Okay. They hear what God's law say, says, but they will not keep it. And those people are out of the loop. They're not going to be made right in the eyes of God. The hearers of the law deserve no grace. That's what I'm saying. Now, let's, let me give you another analogy. You're in a courtroom. You've got a convicted murderer on trial. And the convicted murderer says to the judge, he says, I'm not sorry for killing this person. If I had half a chance to do it over again, I would kill him all over again. And then he spits in the judge's faces. face. Okay. Spits in the judge's face. Okay. Are you as a judge going to forgive this person? Why are you not going to forgive him? Because he's not sorry. I mean, you know, even if you do forgive him, you're still going to stick him in jail, whatever. But anyway, I'm just using this, you know, the analogy falls apart, but, but I'm just using this as an example. No, you're, you're only going to forgive a person who has repented and has made a decision to turn and to, to submit to God. Romans 2 and verse 13, again, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be Justified. Now, hear me when I say this. The doers of the law are not justified by the law. They're justified by grace. And here is where we get understanding. Here we can answer the question, why does this seem to contradict itself? It really doesn't contradict. The doers of the law are not justified by keeping the law. No. They're justified by God's grace. So let's read the two verses again. Romans 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? 
Well, because by the law is the knowledge of sin. The role of the law is just revelatory. It tells us what sin is. It can't make you right. All right. Romans 2 and verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall are going to come into a position to be justified, not by the law, but by God's grace. Only the doers of the law come into a position to be justified by God's grace. Now, so if we summarize these two verses, we could say this. Only those who know what their sin is and repent of their sin are going to be justified freely by God's grace. Now, you might ask the question, well, now weren't there people in the Old Testament <clears throat> who were made right by works? Well, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. James 2 and verse 17. He says this, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. In other words, faith without obedience is dead. Now, you may not know this, but Martin Luther called uh, James here, the Apostle, uh, the Apostle James, the epistle of straw. Because he thought he was, contra James was contradiction, contradicting the grace, grace, grace doctrine, faith alone and all that. No, James was not contradicting that, but he's just saying that your faith and obedience work together is all James is saying. But what I'm saying is Martin Luther called James here an epistle of straw, said he was worthless, useless. You shouldn't even listen. You shouldn't even read the book of James, whatever. All right, let's continue on. James 2 and verse 20. But will you know, know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now, what are, we, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about faith without obedience is just dead. I mean, it's dead. It's not going anywhere. All right, James 2 and verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? You know, God looked at Abraham and he said, that man has the right attitude. I can work with him. And you know, this is really what obedience is, is all about. It, obedience is not what saves us. It just reveals our attitude toward God and toward his law, our willingness to do what he says. It, it's, it's a revealer, our works. He's a revealer of our attitude. It's just that simple. Our attitude toward God, our attitude toward the law of God. All right, James 2 and verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. How did God know Abraham believed? Well, he did what he was told. It's just that simple. He did what he was told. He obeyed God. Verse 24, James 2 and verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Powerful statement. Powerful statement. You know, this, this flies in the face. Flies in the face of a lot of theologies that are out there. Flies in the face of what Martin Luther taught. Okay, you see then how by works a man is, made, is justified and not by faith alone. He's saying the two work together. All right. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. How did God know Rahab the harlot believed? Well, she did the right thing. It was by her works. Okay. James 2 and verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In other words, faith without obedience is dead. So, question, what can I conclude from people who say just faith in Jesus, faith alone? I can, can conclude that it is a dead faith. A dead faith. Yes. All right, what I'm saying is this. Their works revealed a right attitude. God looked at Abraham's works and said, here is a man I can work with. Here is a man that has faith. They were not saved by their works or by their right attitude. They were saved by grace. 
Works revealed their right attitude, the right attitude that God must have. You see, I mean, this, this is really what it's all about. It is God is looking at your attitude toward him, toward the word of God, and toward his law. And there are way too many churches out there who have a bad attitude toward the law of God. In fact, when you hear the law has been abolished, it's been nailed to the cross, that's a bad attitude toward the law of God. And these people, they're not going to be made right. They're not going to be justified by God's grace. They're simply not. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers come into a position to be justified by God's grace. Now, when it comes to God's law, let me ask you a question. Do you have the right attitude? Do you have the right attitude? You know, a lot of people don't. Do you have an attitude of surrender, of unconditional surrender, where you say, aye, aye, sir, I will do what you tell me to do. You know, that's a term in the military, aye, aye, sir. That means I have heard and I understand the commandments or the instructions given to me. Do you have that attitude toward God? God, I understand. God, I will try to carry out what your word says. Do you have the right attitude when it comes to God's law? I remember a long time ago, we had a worker that we had hired to do our masonry work. And the masonry work, it was wintertime, and I think it had slowed down. And so we got him to work on the farm, or my sister's farm. And I, we, we told him we wanted him to dig some uh, holes for a fence post, post hole diggers. You know how hard those things are to work, you know. And he said, I, 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 I can't do that. That's not my job. You see, he didn't have the right attitude. You know, we, we didn't hire, I mean, we hired him to do work, period. But you see, he had a bad attitude, and we soon got rid of him. Well, you see, I think God does the same thing when you've got a bad attitude toward his law. He gets rid of you. He, he doesn't work with you. Now, I didn't say you couldn't be religious. <laughs> oh, believe me. You can go to church six days a week, twice on Sunday, sing in a choir, praise Jesus, I love Jesus, all that. You can go through the motion. But if you've got a bad attitude, toward God's law, you're out of the loop entirely, entirely. You know, the real issue is, now this is a big question what I'm going to ask here. Hold on to your seats. This is going to stun you, shock you. All right, here's the question, is, and I'm going to answer the question. Is obedience required for salvation? You know, if I say yes, you know what people will say? They'll say, he's a legalist. Uh, he's preaching salvation by works, you know. Okay, if I say no, no obedience is not required for salvation. Then I just I'm I'm just a part of mainstream Christianity. I'm just a part of mainstream churchianity. You can hear that every, anywhere you want to go. No, no, nothing's required. You know, just faith alone, just believe. You know, is obedience required for salvation? Let me give you the answer. Yes, obedience is required for salvation. But your obedience is not the agency that saves you. Jesus Christ is the agency that saves us. Grace is the agency that saves you. So is obedience required for salvation? Yes. But obedience is not the agency that saves us. It, obedience reveals your attitude. And it lets God know, hey, here's a person. Can I work with him or not? Oop, no, can't work with him. Oh, he loves his religion. He loves church. He loves singing in the choir. He loves praising Jesus. Oh, yes. He can't get enough of, enough of religion. But I can't work with him because he's got a bad attitude toward the law of God. Now, there's an illusion that a lot of people have. A lot of religious people have this illusion, and they need to be corrected about this. And the illusion is this, that... People in the Old Testament, was, they were saved by works of the law. And the New Testament, Jesus comes along and we got grace, 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 and we're all saved by grace, 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 grace. That's the illusion that in the Old Testament, these people were saved by works of the law. And in the New, we got grace. Let me inform you, people have always been saved by the grace of God. Salvation has always been about the grace of God. You see, Jesus' sacrifice, listen closely, Jesus' sacrifice goes forward and backwards. It covers the people in the Old Testament, what few people God dealt with back then. He didn't deal with a lot. 
He didn't start calling a first fruit until, you know, Pentecost, actually, the day of Pentecost. But it, those people he did work with, they were saved. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were saved by God's grace. So the grace, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice, his grace goes forward and it goes backwards. People in the future, how will they be saved? By the grace of God. People in, back in history, how, how are they saved? By the grace of God. Salvation has always been by the grace of God. But you see, we're talking about obedience. Even with your most heartfelt desire and effort to please God, that you can muster it up you're still gonna make mistakes from time to time. And that's why the agency for your salvation must be by God's grace. In the end, it's all about God's grace. Does God expect you to obey him? Absolutely. Is obedience required for salvation? Absolutely. But the agency of that salvation is not your obedience. It is the grace of Jesus Christ and that's what's really in your Bible. Was there something wrong with the Ten Commandments? Were they weak legislation in the first place? Or did they somehow become obsolete with the passage of time? If, as some suppose, the time came for the Ten Commandments to be abolished, there must have been a reason for it. Order your free copy of Which of the Ten Commandments Did Jesus Repeal? Order by writing to Church of God, Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God, Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, check us out on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.com. If you would like a free DVD recording of this program that you can share with friends and loved ones, write to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. And be sure to mention the title of this program,